<laughs> All right, welcome everybody to our ninth Hops and Harvest dinner. We are here with Ruler Brewing Company. Um, and I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you all for participating. I know there are a lot of you that do this dinner every week or every two weeks. Uh, and thank you so much for your support that you've given Miho and the Brewers Guild, and then of course our craft brewers as well. Um, I wanted to take it back a little bit and tell you guys how Miho got started 10 years ago. It was in Juan's backyard with Kevin, our owner, two friends that met at the Linkery, and that's actually how we know Paige, uh, who was with the Brewers Guild, if you did not know. Uh, and she's kind of my partner in crime as we've been planning these dinners for you. Um, but these beer dinners really got started in Juan's backyard. And so we have always been um, supportive of the craft community, of the craft beer community. And then of course, pairing beer and really good food is really where our passion comes from. And so it's been really cool in COVID to kind of come back to those roots of those beer dinners, serving people in their own homes. Um, now, 10 years later, we really focus on full service catering, where weddings and big corporate events, that sort of thing. But it's kind of been nice to kind of come back to that, um, to the beer dinner and, and come back and be in your homes. Um, that sounds a little bit creepy, but, uh, you know, it's comfortable. And it's <laughs> yeah, um, we've really enjoyed it. So thank you. Uh, it's a great way that we can connect with our community, support our, our local craft brewers, um, so yeah, just wanted to say thank you. And Paige, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the Guild? Yeah, so I'm Paige, the Executive Director of the San Diego Brewers Guild. Uh, the Guild is a nonprofit trade association that represents all of the independently owned craft breweries in San Diego County. It was started in 1997, so we've had significant growth in our membership, um, and then just support of the community of the industry overall. Uh, we have about 125 brewing companies as members that span across about 180 locations throughout the county. So um, again, a lot of local businesses to support and promote, and uh, we help the breweries um, understand and make sure that they're aware of uh, regulations and um, educational opportunities. We try to promote them and get people inside of their tasting rooms and their production facilities um, so that they can experience what uh, that what our craft breweries have to offer um, because everybody has a different experience um, and a business model. And so just trying to find ways to get um, customers into the breweries to find their favorite spots. Um, so I've been with the Guild for about eight years now. Um, and like Lindsay was saying, before the Guild, I was in the service industry and I had worked at the Linkery in North Park. And um, I've definitely enjoyed working with Miho on creating these beer dinner experiences that a lot of our breweries participate in um, outside of COVID times. So it's been really nice creating that experience again that people can enjoy inside their homes and in a comfortable way. Uh, and again, promoting our breweries um, in, a, in pivoting in, in a new in new way, but an old, an old uh, fashioned experience beer dinner. So that's kind of the guild and our take on the hops and harvest dinner. But I was going to introduce Raleigh Macias from Ruler, uh, head ruler is his title, which is a owner, <laughs> head brewer. Um, Raleigh, if you want to do a, a bit of an introduction to yourself and your a little bit of your history and then your brewery, that would be great. And then we can go to Carmine after that. Sure. Well, thank you for uh, letting me participate. I'm super excited. Um, we are Ruler Brewing. It has a lot of extra vowels in it. It's pronounced <laughs> ruler like a, a king or a measuring tape. Um, but it's a, it's a French word that relates back to a cycling term. If you can tell in the background, we're uh, way into cycling here at Ruler and just a general active lifestyle. Uh, we launched uh, this March will be our four year anniversary. So hopefully we get to celebrate this year. We didn't get to celebrate last year, um, but 
you know, we're in Carlsbad up here. Uh, we've grown uh, tremendously over the last four years. Uh, we're a relatively small group. We have just under eight employees right now. We just hired one yesterday. <laughs> so uh, I do uh, the brewing. I'm the head brewer. I write all the recipes. I'm the HR guy. Um, luckily, we have an awesome tasting room staff, so I don't do any of that. You'll rarely see me in the tasting room, but mainly you'll see me in the brewery uh, canning or getting my hands dirty day to day. Um, uh, so, you know, with Ruler Brewing, our, our big our big focus is cycling. So all of our beers you'll see here are, have some kind of cycling uh, relation to them. We usually poke fun at people in cycling. So we'll get to those when we, when we talk to it. It is a silly sport. You know, people are driving around, riding around wearing spandex all day. <laughs> you know, so, but it's, you know, it's, it's fun and we have a unique crowd here and uh, most of our customers don't cycle at all. So it's not a, it's not a biker bar. Uh, you know, we have 90% of our, of our customers just own bikes as a, as a hobby, not really a sport. Um, so yeah, we're, we're super excited. It's been a crazy year. Uh, we're looking to grow this year into a second tasting room hopefully releasing more details on that soon. Um, and then one last fun thing that we'll get into is we just redid all of our packaging. So this is literally um, the first event that people are getting to hold our new cans. They're not even, all except one, are not in markets right now, even though they're canned. And if you look at the born on dates of these cans, they were born literally uh, days ago. So super fresh beer um, canned literally um, three days ago. I love that. Um, Raleigh, do you cycle? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, uh, I have a weird background. I left, uh, Ruler Brewing was my first time ever working in a real brewery. Um, I home brewed for 12 years. I worked in aerospace as a senior mechanical engineer for 14 years and then quit all that and left a beautiful paycheck for uh, running my own business. <laughs> and kind of when uh, I was real deep in the uh, working as an aerospace engineer, I got big and unhealthy. And so I bought a bike and then that turned into hiring a coach and racing and now I do big rides. Uh, the longest I've ever ridden nonstop was just under 150 miles. Um, so yeah, I ride. I don't ride as much as I used to because the business and having two kids at home takes up all my time, but I try to go as often as I can. Sure. Well, I, this is going to be a great segue to Carmine because <laughs> as am I, and I know Paige has a Peloton, so <laughs> that does not count. <laughs> I don't wear as much spandex as I'd like to wear. <laughs> anyway, Carmine, uh, amazing. She's our executive sous chef. She's been with Neho for about three years. Uh, skateboarder, cyclist, all that good stuff. Okay, by cyclist, I mean, I don't do heavy cycling. Like, I think the most, I didn't, 14 miles. That's uh, I IB to Coronado. Yeah, you know, I, I do own a pair of uh, the spandex butt pads, but um I've only used it a few times, um, but I'm trying to buy a new bike. Um, and because of the whole COVID shutdown, I think it, it was hard to find bikes, a good bike, because um, everybody was buying one. Um, but yeah, uh, because I live in North Park, you know, you just got to be active. I mean, I like to say that working in a kitchen is my regular cardio, but it's, it's not enough. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I try to be active by doing some skateboarding. I do ride my bike, I'm a true cyclist, but yeah, I, I, I try to dabble. Um, and yeah, and I, I'm here hanging out with Lindsay at uh, Miho HQ and we're doing some fun stuff. Cool. <laughs> All right, so hopefully your dinner has arrived if you had it delivered or you picked it up at the tasting room. Um, I just wanted to let you know that it is all served family style. So there are two portions in each container. You'll want to go ahead and reheat that to your liking. Some of the dishes are served cold and some of them are served warm and we will let you know as we get into the tasting. Um, but go ahead and replate those. So take them out of the box, put them on plates, 
open the beer, the first beer, put the rest of the beers in the fridge, uh, and you're going to want to split those beers between the two people and just take the first course, take it slow, enjoy, feel free to pause this video. We will have timestamps in the YouTube. So if you want to skip to the second course or come back to it at any point, uh, just look at the notes below. And yeah, I think we're ready to dive in. So Raleigh, do you want to tell us about the first beer, the Blonde Lager? Yep, it's a uh, domestique. It's our um, Belgian style blonde ale. Um, we launched with seven beers in March of 2017. And of tonight, this is the only one from our original portfolio. We still make the other ones, but uh, domestique is one of our first beers. I brewed it at home uh, at least a dozen times before ever brewing it on a large system. It was the first beer brewed on our brewery here in Carlsbad. So it's a Belgian style blonde. Uh, it's won us a lot of awards. It's won a, a World Beer Cup uh, bronze medal. It's currently oh. holding the uh, San Diego International Beer Competition Best in Show. So it got a gold and then all the golds go against each other and it got uh, first place this year. So we have a cool trophy in our tasting room for it. But, uh, you know, if you drink it, uh, it's really... Uh, has a very fruity character because of the yeast. It's a Belgian style beer. So it gets a lot of uh, kind of fruity character. Those are the esters that come from the yeast profile. It uses Belgian Bastogne as the yeast strain. Um, and it's mainly two row with some wheat and very little hot bitterness. It uses Czech saws just to balance it out. So you know, this is this does really well. Blondes aren't very popular styles, but it is a big hitter for us, um, and it just does really well. And in our new packaging, uh, we try to keep it very clean and elegant looking because it's not a it's not a trendy West Coast hazy. Um, it's an old style beer. It's a Blondale from Belgium. So um, you know, we just went very classic white with uh, gold and silver. And you can find this at Trader Joe's right now, year round at all the stores in San Diego. Awesome. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a good beer uh, to go with this type of meal. It's very light, especially if you don't like any hot bitterness. It um, goes well with, with those type of meals. Well, a great beer to kick off the first course, which is octopus. Mm -hmm. um, so our first course would be the, or will be the Spanish octopus Patinesca. So very tapas style in a sense. Um, so we have Spanish octopus. Um, we cooked it until it's tender. Then we're gonna add some char to it by grilling it. Um, we have some um, peewee potatoes, just smaller marble potatoes um, that were, we've cooked. And then we're gonna marinate that with um, just really good sherry vinegar. Um, with that cherry vinegar, it's going to add um, some fruitiness to it, a little uh, slightly sweet, um, um, and then mixed in with a, some extra virgin olive oil. We also have some heirloom tomatoes, green olives, just a little bit of brine to it, but nothing too crazy. Again, with the capers, similar, um, you know, brininess as well. Also to add some little um, salty to that, um, red onions, and just some fresh herbs super simple, clean. Um, I think it'll go great with the beer and it's um, not going to, it's gonna just leave with a clean palate, I think with the beer. Nice, I like that the fruitiness can kind of come together though, those mm -hmm. like flavor hooks and I like that contrast between like the sweetness and the saltiness. And the mm -hmm. um, preparing octopus seems difficult in my mind. Can you tell me a little bit like how we prepare that? And it sounds like it's a warm dish or maybe eaten at room temperature. Yeah. Who we want guests to reheat that. And if so how yeah. do you do that? Um, with that preparation. So octopus, yes, people kind of get a little scared by it. There's many um, preparations. There's many um, like old folk ways of doing it. I've heard um, like boiling it with uh, corks from your wine bottles, help tenderize it. Um, I know when you go out for sushi, oftentimes they'll just um, add salt and just massage it mm -hmm. for a very, very long time, which helps tenderize it. Here, 
We have our own um, kind of own mix of spices that we we just boil um, our octopus in to give it some flavor, and then um, just uh, we cook it until it's tender, pretty much. I mean, I think that's the and it's so funny because um, you know when you eat calamari um, or even just smaller octopus, it's you have to you have to do a quick cooking method with that one. With octopus, I think people think, oh, well, you know, I have to cook it fast because I don't want it to overcook. Well, it's kind of like the opposite. You have to cook it for longer periods of time just because it takes longer to get it um, tender. Oh, and then also um, uh, to serve it. So uh, best at room temperature, but it's gonna come to you cold. So if you just wanna let it sit out for, you know, five minutes, or a little bit more, I think it'll be fine. Um, but again, it's already marinated, and I think it'll just it'll be it'll be great, cold or at room temperature. Yum. Awesome. Does Pantesca just the style in the way that it's being prepared, and or is it like Puttanesca with um, like Italian cooking? It's just olives and there's capers, oh. something briny in that. Um, oh. So it's kind of Mediterranean, if you will, a little mix of that one. Awesome. I'm excited. We're all over the world with this first. Yeah. <laughs> Melting pot. <laughs> Yum. All right. And what about the second course? Let's talk about the Pilsner. Yeah. So the second course is using our bone shaker. Yeah. Bone shaker, New Zealand Pilsner. So uh, we didn't talk about what domestique means, but uh, we'll go back really quickly. That's just a worker bee on a cycling team. Uh, one that can do anything on his team, his or her team, and uh, not a one trick pony. A bone shaker is what they called bicycles when they first came to New Zealand because they had uh, wooden wheels and steel tires. <laughs> and they were the ones with the, they're also, yeah, they would, sh they would shake you apart. Yeah. So we call it a bone shaker and it's a, you know, there's not really such a style as a New Zealand Pilsner. It's basically a German Pilsner with New Zealand hops. So it mm -hmm. uses um, New Zealand Motueka and New Zealand Waiiti uh, in its hops. It is dry hopped. Um, so it's a little bit more bitter than a, a standard German style Pilsner. We launched this beer at our one year anniversary and it was kind of a uh, seasonal beer. And then we kept getting enough people in our taste room, especially that wanted it. And then we got some accounts that wanted it year round that we entered it, you know, basically it made into our flagship lineup. Um, it uses Augustiner yeast uh, and it is filtered. It's one of only, only our loggers here at Ruler are filtered. So. Uh, we have three year-round loggers, and this is one of them. So it's crystal clear, um, uses 100% Pilsner malt, um, and it's usually pretty effervescent. It's it's a little hard to get the carbonation to show through in a can just due to canyon line limitations. But on draft, it's you know it has a head that that sticks around really bubbly and rocky, and it sticks around for you know a good 20 minutes. It doesn't it doesn't really. Uh, fall down like a lot of beers do. So it's one of our favorites here. Um, we're actually brewing a double batch of it as we speak. So if you hear pumps in the background, it's uh, brewing time. Okay, when you say- Oh, I was, ah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, for the people out there, you say dry hops. What does that mean when you say it's a dry hopped beer? So it's a very confusing term. A lot of people, you know, during the certain time of year, there's wet hop season and people think that's the opposite of dry hops. It's completely unrelated. So dry hopping is basically just when you add any kind of hops to the fermenter, either during or after fermentation versus most, you know, hops are added during the boil when it's in the kettle. But once it goes in the fermenter where it lives for anywhere from two to four weeks, um, if you add hops during that time, it's called a dry hopping. And that usually yields no bitterness. It just gives aroma. So you're not boiling the, ho the hops. So you're not extracting really the, the oils in the same way you would in a boil. So it, it really yields more aromas. Now this is lightly dry hopped. It's not uh, like a West Coast IPA where you're doing uh, huge amounts. Um, so it's just very, barely, uh, barely present just kind of hiding in the background. I want to say it's really like that crisp, dry, 
nice pilsner, but you can get those, um, you know, the hops that you were talking about earlier, the New Zealand hop profiles, you can definitely get that on the nose, but in a really delicate and nice way. Yeah. Definitely take the opportunity to, you know, smell, let the beer breathe a little bit, smell it, and then do the tasting. So we always pair this one, just like Domestique, we love to see it with fish meals, lighter things, salads it goes well with. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, that, that's what I love to have it with. Um, at home, I pair it a lot with seafood. Um, so it's kind of the direction you want to go with, but it does have a nice bitterness to it. Um, you know, it's kind of similar bitterness level to an American pale ale. So it does kind of scrub your palate uh, so if you're looking to use it kind of like for that, it will offer that uh, complement to food as well. But it's not that malty sweetness. Yeah, it's, it finishes very dry. So yeah, that's a good point. It finishes around one Play-Doh, which is a measurement that brewers use to define the amount of sugar left over in the beer. Um, so it's very dry. It's a dry pilsner. That's great. And like you said, it pairs really well with salads. And that is our second course, if Carmen wants to kind of go into those details. Yes. Um, this is a very interesting salad because I think people are just so used to having such leafy green type of salad. Well, this one is our shaved root vegetable salad. Um, and these are going to be raw vegetables. And it's kind of nice because um, you'll get textures. Um, we have Mizuno, which is a kind of a peppery, a little bit of bitter, but mostly peppery uh, type of green. Um, we have pickled yellow, yellow beets. We have kohlrabi, um, rainbow carrots, radish, mint, um, toasted pepitas, just to give it a little bit of a crunch. Um, and then we're going to finish it off with some pink peppercorn vinaigrette. Um, and people are going to think that it's going to be spicy or peppery. In fact, pink peppercorn gives more of a floral flavor. Um, it's really nice, um, though it seems a lot in terms of root vegetables, but I really think that it's a, a very refreshing. So I think it goes well with um, the bone shaker just because it's going to, you know, it's, it's light enough, but also cleans your palate afterwards. I think it's a great pairing together. Raleigh, are you going to let Paige drink alone here or? No, I'm going for it this time. <laughs> Um, tell us about this low rider, um, you know, low calorie IPA. So another first, this is literally, uh, you guys are the first ones to get this canned, like it was canned literally days ago. No one has it. It's not even for sale in our tasting room. Uh, the first case that we, that left this building was for these dinners. So, uh, this is only batch two of this beer. We launched it, uh, it was January. I think it was just a month ago. And it's uh, exactly as it sounds. It's a low calorie, uh, juicy IPA. So uh, it, it's basically cloudy, you know, like a hazy. And it has uh, the same dry hopping level as a current, you know, a modern uh, West Coast or hazy IPA. It's around two and a half pounds per barrel of dry hop. Uh, so you should get a really huge citrus tropical aroma. Um, and then it has some flaked wheat and flaked oats in it to give it some body. Because the problem that uh, you, can't, you can't change it is that when you do low calorie and low alcohol, it's hard to get any body out of it. Mm. So you kind of get an imbalanced beer if you're trying to do an IPA, which is supposed to be bitter with something that's thin. So our approach is using uh, flaked wheat and flaked oats, which leave just kind of some more texture on your tongue. Um, it's also a little bit more carbonated to give you a fuller feel in your mouth. Um, so you don't taste how thin it is because you can't, there's no way around the fact that lower amounts of malt are used in making a lower alcohol beer. And so there's not, not many ways to get around not having it taste thin. Um, so I think it does a good job. It's not trying to be a big IPA. Uh, it's only 12 calories per ounce. So a 16 ounce can of ours is 160 calories. Um, I said 10 calories per ounce. So yeah, a 16 ounce can is 160 uh, calories, which is great, but it still has a lot of flavors. So for cycling, we, we did it because 
uh, when I get off of a ride, the last thing I really want is a big, heavy beer. Um, mm. So this is just flavorful and aromatic, but very light. Um, and this uses, <laughs> what's Super that? aromatic. Yeah, it's a huge yeah. punch and it, and it uses a lot of hops in it. So again, like I said, those hops that are in the, uh, the dry hop, which are in the, in the fermenter, those give a huge amount of aroma. So the bone shaker, which we dread, just tried, I said was a really small amount of dry hop. That's like a uh, three quarter pound of hops per barrel. This is two and a half. So you can kind of get a scale of, of how much, uh, how much more hops we use in that process. Um, and it's not filtered, obviously. The whole goal is to have it look this way. Um, so yeah, we're super excited. Uh, it has a fun little California can, uh, low rider, kind of like think about driving a, riding a low rider bike, um, <laughs> low rider, cause it's low, low carb, so low calorie. So yeah, it's just kind of fun. What hops are in that beer? Oh goodness, this uses Equinot. Uh, Simcoe, and then the sexy Strata. You know, we have a Strata contract. We love Strata here. So Strata is one of my kind of, I'm addicted to it now. Two of our beers use it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot going on in this beer, even though it's pretty small and petite. Yeah. Um, well, I think that'll pair really nicely with fish, a nice light meal. Carmine, do you want to talk a little bit about the local catch? Yes. Um, so for the local catch, um, we are using yellowtail. Um, it'll lend nice flaky, um, but also a little bit of sweetness to that too. I think that fish is really nice. I prefer it when it's raw, when I eat sushi, but it's going to be paired with um, some black mussels. Um, um, we're, we got the mussels from British Columbia. Um, so we're going to serve it with uh, a bucatini spaghetti or pasta. And it's the, the pasta that has a hole through it. Um, uh, confit baby uh, fennel, um, some tarragon, um, oh, sp spigarillo uh, broccoli, which kind of um, in flavor and probably um, it kind of looks like a kale. You know, it's just kind of more a, a leafy broccoli. There's no florets to it, um, but uh, very similar to rapini. So it has a bitterness to it, but once you blanch it, saute it, it all kind of mixed in very good, a little hearty as well. Um, and then um, the sauce is a saffron burrotto. So don't think of this as a, um, like a, a like a cream or like a red sauce or anything. A saffron brodo is, is basically um, uh, the cheese rind that we have left over from our Parmigiano Reggiano. We make a sauce out of that one. And in there we add saffron, a little bit of Arbo chili, which it's not spicy at all, um, but it's a really nice color to it. So if anything, it's, it's gonna be kind of like a clear sauce in a sense, but um, very light. And I think it's a great pairing with the beer. Um, and yeah, I think the brininess of the muscles are just really going to bring everything out. Again, I, I keep saying the word refreshing, but I think this menu just pairs well with your beers. Um, so I feel like in this sense, because there's not a whole lot of fat, um, in any of the menu, I think it's just going to be a clean palate after you, you eat and you drink. It wise. <laughs> like musical chairs or like uh, you stop at the stop and you get out of the car what is it called fire drill yeah we yeah just fire, drill. Fire, drill, yeah. fire drill dessert course all right raleigh tell us about this west coast double ipa beast mode how did you get to that beast point? mode yeah so beast mode uh it used to be a different name when we first launched it we launched a lot of new beers at the beginning of this year so this is also two months old. Um, I won't name what it was called, but there was another brewery that had the name and we failed to realize it. Um, Luckily, we didn't get too far down uh, label design and all that. So beast mode kind of applies to anything you're doing, um, you know, but when you're operating or cycling or cooking or brewing and things are working really well and you're doing, you're just, everything's falling together and it feels really great. Um, 
that's kind of like when you say to someone, hey, this is, you're beast mode. I'm beast mode right now. So in cycling, that's, you know, you're about to, you're just riding really well. You feel well. You're getting to the top of the hill before everyone else. You're handling your bike well. That's when a rider's in beast mode. But when I'm brewing, we can be in beast mode. If I'm, I don't know, managing my kids at home, I can be in <laughs> running the business it is, it is. Yeah. so beast mode is kind of applies to anything but we named our double ipa so it's our flagship year-round west coast double ipa beast mode so it's, it's a big beer it's eight and a half percent alcohol but um it's pretty dry uh like most of our beers they don't finish with a huge amount of sweetness so um Typically, uh, those who know the style, a West Coast double IPA is traditionally pretty sweet and malty, um, especially if you were drinking San Diego beer uh, in the early 2000s. A lot of the big beers were malty, finished a little sweet, a little cloying, um, which for me uh, just is exhausting. I like dry beers so that I can have more than one. Now this, you can't really have more than one unless you're going to be home or uh, by yourself, you know, not driving because it's eight and a half percent alcohol. Um, so yeah, it, this beer you know, is brand new. So we're trying to figure out what it goes well with. We haven't paired it with many things on our side. Um, it's the first time it's in cans. Um, it's only the third batch it's been on. Uh, so we're really, really excited with this beer. It's a good stay at home beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finishing off our beer dinner with a nice, uh, heavy beast mode going out strong. So you do, like I'm tasting it now, you do taste a little bit of, um, it's just more body, right? There's a little bit of residual sweetness and that's just kind of unavoidable um, with the beer. It's just a part of the trait. Um, it still finishes relatively dry at 1.3 Play-Doh. Um, and you know, it's, it's definitely proving to be a beer that, uh, you know, we like to pair it with, with bigger dishes or even last week, um, I had a dessert at home. I paired it with, um, it's kind of the, the nightcap beer at my house. So, you know, there's not, there's not much going backwards when you've had this beer, you're not going to go drink low rider right after this. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say the aroma is completely different than you know the low rider which was the one you know the juicy uh before um in the previous course you know where you get a lot of that aroma right on the nose where that's not you know it's just completely different yeah yum and how is that gonna pair with the hummingbird cake yeah i can't hear you hang on there you go Sorry, no, I know you muted me. He's gone now, he just left, so, okay. All right. How is that gonna pair with the hummingbird cake? Um, I think this is gonna be a, a nice, like you said, you know, you're treating the beer as like your nightcap. And I think for me, it's just, you know, I eat, just, I eat dinner to eat dessert. Um, cause that's why I look forward to, um, I know some people go backwards and they're like, Oh, I'll eat dessert before I eat my dinner. No, I'm, I'm very traditional with that. Um, but the hummingbird cake is very similar to a carrot cake. Um, so, um, the cake itself has, um, chunks of pineapple in it. Um, we are, um, serving it with citrus mascarpone mousse. Um, but it's really more of the accoutrements, um, the poached golden raisins, the toasted coconut, um, and then we're going to um, top it off with some diced grilled pineapple. So um, I like, and then sugared pecans, or sorry, uh, caramelized pecans, um, but I like that it is dry, and I know throughout the menu I said you know it's very clean very light refreshing I think this one it's like unadulterated you kind of need that fat you want that sweetness um so I think it, it will go with the dry complement that one and like I say every you know every week it's gonna put you to bed you know you're just gonna you're just gonna just sit back eat your cake and call it a day you know mm -hmm. and what is we'll invite the kids over while you're eating this cake <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. Last week, my son <laughs> ate all of the spice cake. Oh, dang. I was so upset. <laughs> so I'm definitely hiding the dessert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, or like Paige, she typically saves the dessert. So it is not. Oh, yeah, for the next day. Yeah. We got to put it in a different box, you know? Yeah, find it. Yeah. Put like, I don't know, like Brussels sprouts on. I don't know if your kid likes Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Needs anything right now. Yeah. <laughs> Carmine, why is it called a hummingbird cake? Because it's so sweet? It is actually. So um, they named it after the bird because um, it was sweet enough to attract because hummingbirds love nectar. So that's pretty much it. But it's not like sweet to where it's gonna hurt your teeth. I think it's a great balance of everything. Um, the cake is um, has some spices in there as well. So again, if you're a carrot cake lover, I think this is, this is your match. Nice. And that's a big contrast to the beer too. And so when we're mm -hmm. thinking about pairings, there are three C's that we kind of go by and that's gonna be um, contrast, complement, or cleanse, like a cleansing. Mm -hmm. So you either want those flavors to contrast each other, complement them, or cleanse. Um, well, that last course sounds delicious. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> so Lindsay's <laughs> we're going to get to some Q and A. Uh, we did have some people write in some questions, and one of the questions is, "What is the key to a good dessert and beer pairing?" Yeah, I'll start off. Um, the big thing I like to go with, I have some basic rules I follow, and that is uh, poultry and fish dishes. I like to almost always go with a light beer. If you're going to the other end where you're going to have, say, a, a beef dish or something that's spicy, I tend to make, uh, instead of something that complements, I go with something that uh, that is kind of the opposite. So like an IPA is bitter, um, to me, it helps scrub my palate of the spice from a spicy dish um, so I can enjoy another bite sooner. It also kind of uh, heightens the taste of that dish, in my opinion. Uh, and then with dessert, it goes all over the place. Uh, the classic one is, you know, a, a stout or a porter or a barley wine or a wee heavy with a chocolatey dessert. But I've also had... Um, kind of like fruitier desserts with a fruity IPA. Uh, and those seem to go well. So then I go back to the complementing uh, style of pairing. So I would say the be, you know, light dishes, complementing, desserts, complementing. But then, um, you know, when you go into the main course is where I tend to see a wide variance or even, you know, two complete opposites that that end up working well with one another. So I, I guess that's called complimenting, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, um, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Raleigh about, you know, lighter, lighter dishes with a lighter beer. Um, but I think, you know, especially with dessert, the beer finish can always be, you know, have a, a bitter finish to it. So I think something sweet will always complement that. Again, if it's a lighter beer, something fruitful, uh, fruity, um, citrusy go, goes well with that one but yes i'm i'm used to more of this the stouts or the heavier beers for dessert but i think with that one it's not just about sweetness i think it's pairing um you know spices with that one you know cinnamon cloves i think those go go so well with uh, darker or heavier um dessert beers um, but it's all about contrast and like you said, the three C's, um, just anything that just continues to complement, but also make, makes you want to eat more of it and drink. And I think that's, that, that's the best idea. But I mean, when you're cooking, um, it's not just, you know, again, you know, using, uh, fresh produce that will, you know, bring out flavors, but I think it's when you're baking, you can, you know, accent those uh, fruits and flavors, but I think really with beer, I think spice is probably my first um, thinking of, hey, what what will go well with this one? So, yeah, I really enjoyed during these uh, the past beer dinners and this one too, utilizing the last course 
in a in a different way where you know you guys were saying seeing a lot of like stouts and uh browns or just like something more malty and chocolatey to uh with a chocolate dessert and it's really been nice to see and taste how you can put a sour as a dessert beer or mm -hmm. you know having a double ipa as a as the beer to complement a dessert which is something i don't think that i mean i definitely wouldn't be going to those kind of styles immediately for dessert. Um, and it's been really fun seeing that those styles work for dessert too. Yeah. And, you know, I think people also think, okay, well, dessert's always going to be chocolatey, but I think people tend to forget, you know, chocolate goes well with citrus, like orange and chocolate mm -hmm. are a great pairing. So it's not always, okay, well, I have to have a light um, beer because it has orange in it. No, you can go with a darker um a heavier um, beer, but it just accentuates. It just adds a little compliment to the the dish and also the beer. You know, I would finish with with beer. You can get so many flavors mm -hmm. um, just through the you know just with the yeast, for example. If we don't even talk about grain profile or uh, the hops used, just the yeast. Uh, you know, a lot of times here we'll brew a beer. And then we'll brew the same beer with a different yeast and they're dramatically different. They look mm -hmm. the same. They don't smell the same. They don't taste the same. They don't feel the same in your mouth. Um, and just yeast alone can give you that clove, banana character. It can give you, help give a fruity character. It can give zero character. And then you're relying on the hops and the, and the malt. Um, so beer is, you know, in some ways, in my mind, more powerful to pair or more expansive when you, when pairing than wine. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many different styles and ways to each to brew each style that um, you, know, you can really pick and choose what character you're looking for to complement the dish. Mm -hmm. Which I think is so cool. Last week we did the White Labs dinner and the first two courses were the same base beer, like you were just saying, with a different yeast strain and to just taste the differences between those beers. Uh, so cool. I think uh, hops get a lot of attention um, and yeast should get more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeast is what most brewers don't share. You know, everyone's going to ask what hops. Yeah. Um, you ha hops sell. So you, you kind of are forced to share what hops you're using. Grain, people consider it boring, although it is the base of the beer. It matters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's hugely important. But then yeast, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when brewers are talking to one another, hey, what yeast did you use? Most of them keep that close to their chest and uh, won't share much. So forget <laughs> everything you heard earlier. So that's the key question. <laughs> the question should be, what yeast are you using? Now what hops? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, I think that wraps up everything for us today. Thank you for everyone's support. Thank you for supporting Miho, um, the Guild, and then of course, Ruler Brewing. Yeah, we're Thank really looking forward so to this one. And um, I just wanna or send my appreciation out to everybody and to Miho for continuing to make some awesome food and to Raleigh for making awesome beer and, um, Raleigh is also on the San Diego Brewers Guild Board of Directors, so definitely appreciate his time um, and commitment to the San Diego beer industry as well. So um, I hope everybody enjoys their dinner and stop by Raleigh's place and pick up some of these new cans. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Come by. Uh, you can buy these cans soon in the tasting room. They're not quite for sale. We're trying to get through the old packaging first. So again, you guys, you were the first to have them. Um, yeah, look for them on store shelves. If you ever are, don't see it, I always ask. And but people can us. follow you on social. If yeah, Ruler Brewing. Just remember, it has a lot of extra vowels. The more O's and E's you put in it, you're getting closer. The closer it is to yeah. spelling. <laughs> you said it was a, a derived from a French word. So what is the per so it's a pronunciation of that? Ruler. Ruler. Yeah, so it's in cycling. Uh, you only hear it on European broadcasts, but it's when they're talking about a um, an all-arounder. 
in cycling. So uh, mm. in cycling, just like any sports, there are specialists, there are climbers and sprinters, and there are these big teams. And each person on the team has a different job to protect their leader. But a, ru a ruler is, is a guy, it's like a romantic term you hear. It's not an official role, but it's a romantic term you hear like on a, it, when they're broadcasting that, oh, that rider is a ruler. He, he can do anything. If his, if his climber's sick, he can go in and fill in that position. If the sprinter's sick or injured, he can go in and do that position. So, you know, take it how you want, but that's kind of what we do at Ruler Brewing is we have a Belgian Blondale next to a West Coast, next to a Kettle Sour, next to a Barrel Age Sour. And, you know, we heavy on our board. We're not a, a lager house or a hazy IPA place. Uh, we do a lot of different styles. We have a light American lager. We have a seltzer. So we're trying to experiment and play with everything. And uh, so it's kind of the, the same level of thinking. Not a one trick pony. Love it. Well, again, thank you to everyone for uh, participating in tonight's dinner, and we hope you enjoy it. Yeah, don't awesome. forget to share social media, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Nice to meet Cheers. you, Ali. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Kate. Bye, everyone.